Queer Relationships, an IM clinic podcast devoted to helping you, the LGBTQ plus community, create the love lives and relationships you crave. Have you ever felt yourself spiraling in a pattern that just leaves you feeling so hopeless and confused? Maybe you've told yourself that you will never, ever find yourself in another shamed moment in that pattern, but then the enticing whispers convince you to just indulge one more time. In today's episode, I take a deep dive with the fellow therapist Hudson into a very important topic, how our shame can become trauma and turn into emotional content keeping us spiraling in a pattern that leaves us feeling defective, deficient, and possibly even damaged. I hope you enjoy. Let's take a listen. I think I'm seeing shame show up for so many folks as a barrier to change and a barrier to the things that they're desiring and wanting to implement. Mm -hmm. And folks are getting stuck in this cycle of shame, which I am seeing does not allow growth, Mm -hmm. right? Um, That when we're in this place, I feel that shame only creates more shame rather than allowing us to exit. Mm -hmm. And so I'm seeing people just getting trapped in these cycles and not being able to break out. Yeah, yeah. I think that shame is um, such an insidious force. And this is maybe a dramatic way of talking about it, but I kind of want it to articulate the drama that it does come with. So in my experience, trauma and shame they travel together. When trauma shows up, shame shows up. In other words, shame is given to us by an unhealthy person, whether that be a legitimate perpetrator or a wounded parent, a clergy, a culture, a society. So we're we're receiving shame But the sick thing about shame is we internalize it and start to use it against Mm ourselves, And that's how shame becomes so powerful. I receive shame, I internalize it, the pain it causes, I can tolerate it so much until I have to medicate the pain. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite little counseling quips is, I will always soothe myself with the one thing that shames me. That's how shame works. Mm -hmm. We can tolerate the pain of living as this inadequate, this inferior person until the pain is so intense that I need to soothe somehow. My go-to was a glass of red wine that turned into seven, that turned into waking up in a park, Mm -hmm. not knowing how I got there. Mm -hmm. Then the embarrassment, the guilt, the lack of self-respect would say, I'm a damaged person. I would hold that pain after having this drinking episode till I couldn't hold the pain anymore, then I would drink again because it was going to be fun. I would relax. I would laugh with my friends Mm -hmm. and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'll describe that a little bit more in detail. So when we're thinking about shame, we also want to think about something called the ego split. And this is something that kind of lays the foundation for us to understand shame, at least from my perspective. Mm -hmm. Let me start in a unique place. The The ego split describes that our desires are like a ball of clay. Mm-hmm. And over time, it's like society, religion, parents, friends at school, partners, they take a little piece of that clay, they take a little piece of our desire, and they define it. They categorize it as either clean desire or a dirty desire. After a while, we realize that our desires have been split in half, so they're no longer functioning as one innocent, cohesive unit, but now they're, they're um, bifurcated, they're, sh- they're shoved into two categories. We will praise the desire, we'll parade around the desires that feel clean, and we'll let everybody see them, we'll make sure that everybody sees them. Mm-hmm. My desire to be brilliant, or 
attractive, powerful, smart, cunning, uh, charismatic. And we will hide all of the desires that are called dirty. So my desire to feel cherished, my desire to feel belonging, mm -hmm. my desire to feel beautiful. Mm -hmm. After those have been called dirty by someone else, I will start to hide them. Mm -hmm. And so the, the first step of the shame experience is receiving the shame when someone categorizes our expressed desire as dirty. I expressed the desire to be safe with you. You abused me. Mm. Then I, I told myself that asking to feel safe will never happen. It's a dirty desire. And I tuck it away. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but as we hide that desire, so now we're hiding this thing that feels dirty within us, it's going to create pain. Mm -hmm. The pain of not feeling safe, not belonging. In this shame experience, we're not calling it shame quite yet, although shame is already starting to develop. It's already gaining momentum. To medicate that pain, we will fantasize about the one thing that will actually soothe that very specific pain. Mm. The fantasy in and of itself is a medication inherently. Yeah. When I, you know, I'm having a, a shitty day, right? No one knows I'm queer. I have to pretend to be masculine. I'm living in a Christian fraternity where, every, where I feel like everybody will chastise me. I have to be perfect. No one can know. I have to pretend to be masculine. To carry that pain for a day, two, three, four, five, after a while it was like, I just want to have fun. I just want to let my hair down. I just want to laugh and throw caution to the wind. I'm just going to meet a friend for a drink. That fantasizing of, I just want to feel free, is already medicating the pain. Mm -hmm. So that takes us to the next step. Mm -hmm. We will feel excitement for the relief. We will expect our fantasy to actually produce relief, and we can actually become euphoric. Mm -hmm. This becomes really, really momentous mm -hmm. when it involves sexuality. Mm -hmm. If I feel inadequate, and then I post a picture of myself on Grindr, the fantasy is some trophy person will want someone like me and to be medicated by them and their acceptance of me right. becomes really euphoric. Mm -hmm. It's going to feel spectacular. I'm going to feel loved. I will have this deep sense of belonging this euphoria can be trapping. It is, yeah. it's it, like... And, and almost blinding yes. from what we know is going to then transpire from engaging with it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's like being in the desert, seeing a mirage, and like, thank God there's water, and right. then diving into nothing but sand. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> but the mirage is... The mirage is convincing right when we're in that desperate dry hot mm. environment feel anything but that the mirage is convincing we literally think it's there acceptance joy yeah. thrill relief mm -hmm. is coming oh, gosh. and so then of course the next stage in this little shame serpentine is we self-soothe by acting out the fantasy we actually dive headfirst into it. Mm -hmm. And I do think that there, we're smart and cunning, right? Like the first glass of wine, I do get to laugh. The second glass of wine feels even better. Mm -hmm. The sex feels great to have this hot person say, hey, I want you. Yes, yeah. come to my house. Mm -hmm. That is, it feels like the recategorizing of our desire. Mm -hmm. Someone is saying this desire that has previously been called dirty, and now this person is calling it clean. Right. I get to express it, but I think more importantly, it's saying I get to be it. Mm -hmm. I actually get to be valuable. Mm. And that is part of the shame. Yeah. That is part of shame's ability to lie to us. Right. right. Mm. Because it's temporary. Mm -hmm. So what we do 
we dive into this fantasy, we make it become reality, and the moment it's over, we have guilt flooding our body, and we realize that all of our expectations are shattered. They're just crumbles on the floor. Right. Um, right after the orgasm, the next day going to work, the hangover, right. um, the, the whatever it might be, I don't want to create a trigger warning for someone here, but it can be very uncomfortable the next right. morning. Right. Um, kind of the disillusion that the fantasy for sure. has hurt you mm-hmm. rather than healed this part. Yeah, for sure. This idea that I can I can find, I just want to, because it starts off, the fantasy is I'm just going to go to the bar and have fun. Mm-hmm. We don't realize how deep the pain is going and how much, metaphorically obviously, how much wine we need to fill up this deep cavern of pain inside of my soul. And we drink, I used to drink more than, mm-hmm. definitely than I needed. Mm-hmm. But if I could look at how deep the pain went, that's as much wine as I needed to fill it up. Yeah. Yeah. And then to wake up the next morning not knowing what happened, not knowing what I did or where I went or with whom I interacted. Yeah. I mean, that guilt and the reality of this fantasy that just exploded in my face was really, really profound. Mm-hmm. I'd have to lie to work because I, you know, I was supposed to be there at 745 and right. I woke up at 930 and mm-hmm. they were scared as hell. They didn't know where I was. Mm-hmm. It's It could be a very big explosion yeah. in our face. Yeah. So what that drama causes, and now we're kind of moving through the shame serpentine, is the this little box up here on the top right. And I call this the fallen trifecta because it feels like we literally kind of like fall and crash into this thing. Mm-hmm. But at first, it's the valuelessness. I told, if I were to look at me as an outsider, I wouldn't want me. Therefore, no one else is mm-hmm. going to want me. Who would want someone who did that last night? I'm so chaotic. I'm so damaged. <clears throat> the one thing I wanted was belonging. And now I'm creating separateness. Mm-hmm. I think when shame is a pattern in our life, the next one is powerlessness. I told myself, Isaac, I would never drink that much again. I would never black out again. And I did it. I can't even trust myself. Mm -hmm. This is where I think shame is, can actually legitimately be traumatic. And this time it's not a perpetrator traumatizing me it's me traumatizing myself and how disempowering this place feels right to to even entertain the thought of how could i do different that does does can't even exist in this space Mm -hmm. right because we've lost all power and almost control a sense i guess of control right Yes, absolutely. One of my worst moments, it's it's a thing I reflect on a lot, but um, I went out drinking. It was supposed to be a night of fun, and I got lost. I got just um, separated from my group of friends. Some My cousin drove all the way um, up to Boulder, Colorado to pick me up and took me down to Littleton, Colorado, where he lived, and we stopped at Denny's first. Mm-hmm. I was so drunk. I remember being at the the table, eating probably a ham and cheese omelet. That's what I love. And then I remember I have this flash of a memory of laying on the bathroom floor next to a toilet. Mm -hmm. The next memory that I have is me laying in the rocks in a median outside the Denny's. The next thing I remember is it's 9 a.m. and I'm waking up on the please wait here here bench inside of the Denny's. Mm -hmm. I had passed out there. Mm -hmm. And I remember waking up and the hostess looked at me as though I was the most despicable person on the planet. Mm -hmm. And this was not the first time I had found myself in a situation like that. And I told myself, Isaac, you promised yourself you would never do this again. And yet you keep doing it. Mm 
who knows what happened to you last night mm -hmm. and that that kind of fear mm -hmm. that i could let go of my own self-protection so easily scared the living daylights out of me mm -hmm. i couldn't even trust myself to keep myself mm -hmm. safe and my anxiety was through the roof that is trauma and i was causing it to myself mm. so this powerlessness can ravage us apart you know i think a, a little trigger warning here especially when we feel powerless against a perpetrator a hundred percent of the time people will come in here saying i should have been strong enough to say no yeah. to get away Right. to <clears throat> mm -hmm. do whatever and the powerless lives in us and as as a clinician doing trauma treatment one of the things that is so profound to help treat is the powerlessness yeah. that comes from shame yeah because mm -hmm. it's it will literally cripple someone so that's the second stage mm -hmm. the third stage is worthlessness because I keep doing this, I'm never going to succeed at life. I'm never going to continue to progress. I don't deserve good things. Mm -hmm. I will never access them. I can't. This is where I say shame is not a cognitive recognition. I'm worthless and powerless and I'm valueless. It is the experience of feeling that way. Mm -hmm. yeah. So shame is never this aware mm -hmm. awake moment where we say mm -hmm. oh this is shame <laughs> it's the yeah. it's the physical mm. experience of feeling valueless powerless and worthless that's i i like looking at the shame serpentine because when we can sit right there with clients with friends with family members we can say what i'm hearing in you is not the truth what I'm hearing in you is your experience of shame. Yeah. And that's transformative. Mm -hmm. And just, it just is such a powerful place to be, right? And there is so, this can, this little section that we're in, right? The, what did you call it? The, the fallen trifecta. The fallen trifecta feels it's it, i mean as you're describing this it's sounding like such an anchor right mm -hmm. that just like mm -hmm. yep. holds you stuck in place yes and yeah just so so powerful this place and yeah i love what you're saying here because the fallen piece it it is like falling into a trapdoor where we're we're stuck down there. The the part about the fallen trifecta is that it reinforces that the desires are dirty. Mm -hmm. I am powerless. No one will want me. And this kind of takes us to the next little chunk at the top of the chart. Mm -hmm. What we do in this experience is we focus on our behavior, not the desire that drove us to the behavior. Right. And we, in our culture, love to judge ourselves by the behaviors we commit. Mm -hmm. And that is another powerful trick of shame, mm. is to say, Isaac Leon, look at what you just did you drank too much, mm -hmm. you had to have a cousin come get you, you couldn't even sit at the dinner table, you slept on a bathroom floor, you were in the rocks, look at what you did. And because of the powerlessness, I tell myself, I am really effed up. Mm -hmm. I can't even control my behavior. Is this compulsivity within me that profound that I can't even control my arms and my hands to do the thing I need them? Like this is, we, we just focus on behavior so much that the emotional craving mm -hmm. fuses with the behavior. Mm -hmm. 
I would kind of obsess and ruminate because I was so desperate to get out of the shame serpentine that I would say, okay, let's rewind the tape. Okay, I sat at the bar. What was I thinking during my first drink? And then I'd even mm. back up more. What, why did I even make the choice to go to the bar in the first place? And I would come to this point of reduction where I said, every time I want to have fun mm. and to feel alive, I end up drinking. And so the fusion was between the behavior and the desire. Every time I want to feel alive, special, mm -hmm. joy, that desire, quote unquote, makes me behave a certain way. Mm -hmm. So if I want to get rid of the behavior, mm -hmm. I have to get rid of the desire. Mm -hmm. And so I was telling me myself, I was reinforcing the narrative that when I want to experience vitality, life, joy and belonging, I'm a shitty person. So then I told myself that those desires were dirty. Right. And I participated with shame. Yeah. And so interesting how kind of self-fulfilling prophecy <laughs> interweaves in here. Mm -hmm. That's why I say shame is given to us, but we internalize it. Mm -hmm. And then we literally start using it on ourselves. And we don't even recognize it. Yeah. We, don't, we don't know that we're using the belief that our own beautiful desires are dirty. Mm -hmm. And we live holding them as though they're dirty. Mm -hmm. And it's painful. Of course yeah. we're going to need to medicate that pain. Right. Of course. Right. I can only tolerate a certain amount of loneliness. Right. A certain amount of feeling inadequate and well and when these desires are to be loved to be accepted to be seen to have belonging yes. and we're telling ourselves that that's dirty Ugh, what a painful place yes yes that is a perfect segue into the next portion here because we see this fusion if I want to change my behavior, I have to get rid of this desire. I have to lock it up even more because we began saying, I am this person. I am unlovable. The, the fallen trifecta here is now creating mm -hmm. an identity for us. Mm -hmm. It's no longer, look at what I did. I began saying, I am who I this am. shitty ass person who drinks too much. I am that person. I am that damaged. And yeah. now shame is literally distorting our own, not only our own identity, but our inability to experience inherent value. As some of you may know, we have launched a coaching wing to the clinic called I Am Counsel. This allows us to take our clinical expertise and make it available to you no matter where you are in the world. Coaching helps us answer questions like, who am I? Where am I going and how will I get there? If you find yourself asking these questions in a coming out process, or being a straight parent of a queer child, or in a confusing job transition, or even in a rocky relationship, coaching is a great fit for you. To get more information, check us out at IamCounsel.com. That's IamCounsel.com. We'd also like to be available for your questions, no matter how big or how small. Slide into our DMs, baby, and leave us a message. You can find us on the Insta at LGBTQ underscore therapy and on TikTok at Isaac Forte. That's I-S-A-A-C-F-O-R-T-E. Drop us your questions and we'll make sure it gets into the next Queer Relationships Q&A. Now back to the show. So what do we do? We pick up the desires that have been taught to us as clean and we make a better show. We make a more spectacular parade. Mm. Yeah. We, yeah, go ahead. we trap ourselves into being really good performers mm -hmm. as a way of not only propping up our self-esteem, but avoiding these bad behaviors, mm -hmm. quote unquote, that make us a bad person. Mm. Yeah. Would you say that in that place, there's 
of reaching for a mask to be worn. Oh, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there's a YouTube video that people can watch on the Ego Split. It's on our, our YouTube page. But in the video, you'll, you'll see me kind of hold the clean desires up in my hand mm -hmm. and the, the dirty desires like wrapped in a ball behind me and tucked behind my back. Mm -hmm. That's the ego split. Mm -hmm. It's parade, parade, parade. I have this facade up. Mm -hmm. And then when the lights turn off and the pain is so high, I drop what I call the clean desires and I like, like ravage mm -hmm. the dirty desires. I'm like eating them like I've been starving for four right. years, like dirty desires all over my face, dripping down my shirt because mm -hmm. I didn't use a bib, and I'm, I'm consuming them mm -hmm. because no one's looking. No one will know what I'm doing. And it's at least I can engage the part of me that is screaming from inside of me. Right. But then we stand in the mirror and we say, look at what kind of mess you made. You just ate blueberry pie with your hands wearing a white outfit. That's the fawn trifecta. Mm -hmm. No one's going to want you. Mm -hmm. I told myself I wouldn't eat blueberry pie like this again. Mm -hmm. And I don't deserve to wear white things. Look at what I do. Yeah. So the identity becomes, after we have cycle through this, I am this person. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to have to live with being a person walking around with a stained persona. Mm -hmm. This is just who I am. Mm -hmm. Oddly enough, though, when we've lived here long enough, we actually start to feel comfortable there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because I get to hide. Mm -hmm. If I'm hiding this stained person that I am, I don't have to be seen by anybody. Mm -hmm. And that can actually be kind of comfortable. Yeah. It um, compounds the pain mm -hmm. started by the ego split, but it's also kind of a relief not to be held accountable or to not be seen to not show up right right or to not have these desires to be deemed as dirty mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to f yeah feel all of that yes yuck so hiding can actually feel kind of safe mm -hmm. but there's also this tricky thing that we do <laughs> <laughs> and we say who are you to tell me what i can and cannot do I can eat blueberry pie. I can have seven margaritas. I can do whatever I want. Mm. And so don't tell me that what I'm doing is wrong. And of course, I'm not here to be the moral police, but I also want to be protective. And so when people are using the shame experience from a place of entitlement, mm. I get to do whatever I want. Mm -hmm it looks to me like a lot of pain. Yeah. Yeah. I get to treat myself this way. Mm -hmm. And it's not like, oh, you're out there like liberating, like living your best life. It just looks like you're, you're medicating hurting. your pain because you're mm -hmm. hurting so much. And oh, so... Yeah, and just like no regard for your own self. Right. At all. At all. Yeah. At all. There was this one time I was in a trauma session and I was um, doing EMDR. Mm -hmm. And it was like I was being flooded with all of these memories of feeling like I was trash. Like mm -hmm. people were treating me like I was trash. Mm -hmm. And then in the EMDR session, it I began to see that I began to treat myself like trash because that's what I was told. And... As a college student, I would have said, whatever, I'm 21, get to do whatever I want. I'm going to go drink if I want. But I didn't realize that underneath all of that entitlement was this idea, Isaac, you're trash, so go treat yourself like it. Never in a million years was that ever a conscious thought. Right. But that is the subconscious nature of shame. Mm -hmm. mm. And it is alive in us, and we don't even know it. <sighs> yeah, and it just keeps you walking down the same thing. Mm -hmm. I actually have a, I don't know what this is called or if we have time, but I have a yeah. quick poem that oh. feels very relatable. Yeah, let's totally do it. Um, I could look up the name to give you, but it goes, 
Um, I walk down the street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in. I am so lost. I am helpless. It isn't my fault. It takes forever to find a way out. Chapter two. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I pretend I don't see it. I fall in again. I can't believe I am in the same place, but it isn't my fault. It still takes a long time to get out. Chapter three. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it there. I still fall in. It's a habit. My eyes are open and I know where I am. It is my fault. I get out immediately. Chapter four. I walk down the same street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. Mm -hmm. Chapter five. I walk down another street. I love that. Mm -hmm. I think it's a short story in like five paragraphs or something. Mm -hmm. But that feels really like oh, this. Oh, for sure. In a, yeah. You know, as a clinician, walking through my own shame first and then helping people walk through theirs to think about not falling into that hole is very jarring because we spent so much time down there mm -hmm. we kind of set up shop mm -hmm. it kind of becomes our home yeah and we're so comfortable we're so comfortable there we know what to expect yes. here mm -hmm. it's not good but at least i know what this is right it almost kind of became like the locker I'm shoved into, but the locker where my favorite snack is hanging out, mm -hmm. where that warm, comfy sweater is, mm -hmm. you know, my favorite little album is down there. Yeah. And I slip into it and I kind of just stay comfortable. Mm -hmm. This is why I say we will always soothe ourselves with the one thing that shames us. Because we are that cunning, even if it's unconscious. I will soothe myself with alcohol because it gives me the ability to let free and I laugh differently and I can embrace jokes. And I'm not even aware that that is tied to my shame experience mm -hmm. or that I'm using it in a sense to kind of torture myself. Right. And in the fantasy, the soothing agent, whatever mm -hmm. it might be, the, the hookup, the alcohol, the poor behavior, whatever it is, it always seems perfect in our fantasy world. Yeah. yeah. And of course, I'm not saying all hookups are wrong or right. drinking is wrong. It's not what I'm saying. Right. But when we're using it to medicate the pain mm -hmm. of a, a dirty desire, right. a desire that feels dirty, yeah. that's when it becomes a misery stabilizer. I'm stabilizing my misery yeah. by soothing myself with the one thing that will shame me. Mm. So then it kind of sounds like to exit this, right? How can we take these dirty desires mm -hmm. and love them, mm -hmm. right? And retrain teaching yes. ourselves that these desires are not dirty at all. Yes. And that, right? to take mm -hmm. them from behind the back. Mm -hmm. if, I'm, if I may say so, I do, Hudson, believe that that's really brilliant of you because a lot of people say, well, just tell me how to stop the behavior. Mm. And that's not <laughs> yeah. where we start at oh, all. Oh, yeah. And we I want it that. to be that easy. For sure. Yeah. Oh, I remember yeah. that. Years. I'm yeah. going into therapy and being of with course. my first therapist. Oh, Shannon, I drank again. <laughs> Tell me how to stop. And then in the addictions model, it was like, okay, well, here's how you stop drinking. Never, ever, ever did we put focus on the desires yeah. that were legitimate, that would lead to a fulfilling life, right. <clears throat> but that were also called dirty and therefore mm. literally quarantined. Mm because they could infect me or other people. Right. I always say that sometimes when we come out of the closet, we don't bring our desires with us. And I think that's, that's a very profound casualty 
to say, yeah, I'm out and I'm proud, but I'm leaving in the closet so no one can see my desire <laughs> to be femme or masculine or precious Gosh, yeah. or special or talented mm -hmm. or charismatic, brilliant. Mm -hmm. We're afraid yeah. of bringing all of those desires that homophobia and transphobia and biphobia and xenophobia, whatever has told us are dirty, and we will leave them in there. Yeah. I think this, the, the tie that I want to make here is we leave them in the closet because it's a different thing to verbally come out mm -hmm. than living out. To live out is to say, I am <laughs> queer and I want to be loved mm -hmm. and I'm going to let you see me be loved by this person. That's a totally different kind of vulnerability. Absolutely. So I definitely agree when we come out of the closet we have to take our desires mm -hmm. with us but we have to do some pretty deep work to say this desire to be accepted yeah. isn't far-fetched it's not wrong mm -hmm. it's not selfish mm -hmm. it's not mm -hmm. embarrassing it is beautiful and it is innocent that's the first step this cognitive reframing the next step is to then internalize it so that that desire actually feels mm -hmm. innocent. Mm -hmm. That's the hard part. I'm chuckling because I was going to say, oh, that's the hard, the first part was uh -huh. the hard part. And then you said that, and I was like, oh, gosh. <laughs> it's all the hard uh -huh. part. But that's, yeah. that is, in my mind, mm -hmm. the sixth phase of coming out. And there's mm -hmm. a blog on our website for that. But the sixth phase is repairing the ego split, saying all of the beautiful desires that inform me of my queerness, mm -hmm. they were chastised and called dirty. And now it's my responsibility to go get that bag from the back of my closet yep. and embrace them. Just love it. And to love them. Because then that shows up saying, hey, I want to feel precious. Mm -hmm. Can you... Can you regard me that way? Can mm -hmm. you love me? Hey, I want to be seen mm -hmm. in this outfit, with that hair, with this this expression of who I am. Will you do that for me? Yeah. And when we as queer people do that for each other, we're not only helping each other come out, mm -hmm. we're not only helping each other live authentically, yeah. but we are the reparative agents for one another that we've needed all along. And that, that yeah. is powerful. Oh, yes, it's so true. To be in a place, yeah, where someone can just look at you, right, in that mm -hmm. way that mm -hmm. tells you, I am not dirty. Yes. I am okay to be me is so powerful. Totally. And it's a, a, the most beautiful gift. Oh, yes, yeah. it is literally life-changing to have mm -hmm. Sa life-saving yes and then to be able to do that back to them this is why i believe love is just so profound because we we get to categorize mm -hmm. these desires as clean yeah. but we begin to repair the identity distortion that shame creates we begin this is why we called it I am clinic from I am dirty, I'm damaged, I'm mm. powerless, I'm worthless, I am valueless. That relationships repair that I am to I am whole, I am enough, I am cherished, I am lovable. Mm -hmm. And we get to do that for each other. As many of you may know, my biggest hope for all of us in the queer community is that we learn to love ourselves so much that we're open to being loved and loving others fully. Shame has no place in our lives, but because of systemic prejudice and hatred, sadly our lives are flooded with it. So let me just say it this way. It is not our fault that shame has distorted our identities. 
but it is our responsibility to clean it up, and we can. Powerlessness is like a key turning our shame into trauma. Remember, one of the major ways we can repair our identities and heal from the trauma is to shift our focus away from our behavior and zero in on the desires that have been categorized as wrong. And as we reclaim those desires and categorize them as pure, we start to take back the power. We start to heal the shame and we drop the powerlessness in our lives and in our relationships and we start to embrace our power. So here are some thought prompts to get you connected with the subconscious narratives that might host and distort your identity. The first one is, at what point do you buckle under the pressure? The pressure of tolerating the pain of an isolated and quote-unquote dirty desire. Identifying that moment in time will give you a lot of power to really identify the primary emotion, that beautiful, innocent little sucker down there, and nurture the hell out of it. Number two, when you feel yourself getting close to medicating the pain, what fantasies do you create and for what medication do you reach? Is it a substance, a ritual, a person, or maybe even a role you play within relationships? As we feel ourselves approaching the medication point and the fantasy creation, we have another ability to intervene and really nurture our desires. Here's another question that might really require some silent reflection and persistent observations, so take your time. This one will require you identifying what street you walk down and what hole you might commonly fall into. Here it goes. What shame narrative has become your identity? In other words, what behavioral pattern has been so filled with powerlessness and persistence that it feels like who you are? Sometimes these identities are shaped by the outright disempowering experiences like smattered blueberry pie on a white blouse. But other times, our medications work too well like an addictive narcotic that leaves us flooded with one-up pompous energy. In this light, be courageous to let go of the identities that leave you feeling good in some aspects of life, but then turn to leave you feeling defective in others. Take time on the subconscious level to identify where the sneaky, an unconscious shame process has convinced you to adopt an identity that you were never intended to embrace. You were meant for more than living small and twisted up by shame. I promise. Now, get out there and go create the love lives and relationships you crave by starting with loving yourself and your desires shame-free. Mwah. Queer Relationships is a podcast sponsored by I Am Clinic, a counseling practice devoted to the LGBTQ plus community with in-person and virtual counseling options available. I Am Clinic, create the love lives and relationships you crave. Find us online on Instagram at LGBTQ underscore therapy and Facebook at I Am Clinic. That's I-A-M Clinic.